Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church, New Braunfels. I'm so glad you've chosen to worship with us again this morning. There are so many things to be thankful for, and one of those is the fact that we get to meet, whether it's in person or here online, to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are still some exciting things happening in the life of the church. One of those is Awana. Awana starts back up on September 9th, and when you visit the church's website, you'll find how to register and to sign up for volunteer opportunities as well. Church family, I wanna encourage you to continue in your faithful giving. When you give, it enables the church to serve locally, in our community, and around the world. So there are three easy ways for you to do that. Text the word GIVE to the number on the screen, visit the church's website, or mail your check-in. This morning, as Pastor Brad opens the word, we're going to learn from Scripture that God's will for every Christian, for you and me, is that we control our bodies for His glory. But first, let's join together in a song of praise. Thank you, Vince. Let's join together this morning and sing, celebrate of what Jesus has done for us. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes all. Your endless 
Hey, thank you, team. Let's take our Bible now. We are turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I will begin reading there in the first verse. God's Word says this, Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God as you are doing, do this even more. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God. This means one must not transgress and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner, because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses. We also previously told and warned you, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives his Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these words. I pray that you will drive them deeply into our heart and mind, Father. And may we respond rightly, Lord, to you. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to tell you about a, a couple who were looking to hire a driver for them, a chauffeur for them. You, you may be in the same position looking to hire a chauffeur uh, for your life. They, they found four candidates that they wanted to um, uh, uh, put through a driving test. And they were asked this, they were asked to park as closely to a brick wall as they could without scratching the car. Well, the first driver was pretty good. He moved the car to within one foot of the wall. The second driver, well, he was a little bit better. He moved that car to within six inches of the wall. The third driver, well, he was even better. He moved that car to within three inches of the wall. Well, the fourth driver came along and he parked the car three feet away from the wall. <laughs> when uh, the potential employer asked, why, is, uh, why did you park so far away from the wall? Well, that man answered this way. He said, there's no reason to risk damaging such a beautiful car. <laughs> he had a different mindset than the other three. He understood that true skill in driving is not based on uh, so much the ability to steer away from a near miss, but to keep a wide margin of safety. You know, we're dealing with this subject in which all of us need to keep a wide margin. There's really two subjects here, and we'll, we'll work out those two subjects. But that second subject, it's one of those subjects that we just need to keep a wide margin of safety. If you look in your word with me, beginning in verse 1 uh, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we find some encouragements and we also find a warning all directed toward our sanctification, our growing up in, our maturing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we look in these verses, we understand this. We understand that Paul has already made clear that uh, the believers in the church in Thessalonia, well, they're committed followers of Christ. They've gone through suffering. They've gone through difficulty, through trials. They, they have become worthy of imitating. He said, you are a strong, believing church in the Lord Jesus Christ. They put away their foreign uh, uh, pagan gods. They've given everything over to the Lord. It's a strong church. So, so why did Paul include this section, why do you include this section about steering clear of sexual immorality? Well, let's track back to uh, the last part of chapter 3, verse 10. What did, he, what did he say he wanted to do there? He said he wanted to complete what was lacking in their faith, meaning he wanted them to continue to grow up in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, no, gap, no doubt, he gave them the uncompromised gospel. He told them plainly of the truth of Jesus, the hope of Jesus, the eternity found only in Christ and Christ alone. And they were following as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But he's also reminding them here that God is deeply concerned of how we live our daily life. He's deeply concerned in how we walk through or live or conduct our life in the days in between our salvation and our home going. Jesus came not just to to make us children of God, and we're thankful that He did, but He also came to enable us to live as the children of God, to live as children of God in this dark and sinful world that does not know the hope and the peace that is only found in Christ. So let's, let's take these next few moments just to work this text out and let the Lord Jesus, through His Spirit, speak to us uh, in these moments. Now, important thing here, Paul encouraged the Thessalonians to live a life of purity, to live a life of purity. There is great freedom found in living a life of purity for Christ, even in a culture with rampant sexual immorality. And so I want to encourage you today, as we uh, allow God's Word to speak, I want to encourage you to live that same way because that's what the Word of God is encouraging us to do today as well. And so our passage deals with a couple of areas of the will of God. It deals with the general will of God, uh, and then it deals with something more specific in the will of God. So let's get, begin with the general will because it's how Paul introduces uh, this subject. God's will for me uh, is this. God's will is that I grow in purity, holiness, sanctification in Christ. All right. I want to look at verses 3 and verses 7. Verse 7 here as kind of bookends to this particular section. For this is God's will, your sanctification. Then down in verse 7. For God has not called us to impurity, but he has called us to live in holiness. In holiness. Now, both of these verses, well, they express the will of God for every life of every believer in Christ. God has not called has called you to be sanctified. He's called you to be set apart for his purpose. He's purpose for you, his redeemed child to do this, to live a holy life. Not a perfect life because he knows that we will never be able to attain that perfection. But to live a holy life, to live a set apart life for him as we live in and through Christ. And friend, you need to take uh, need to take God's purpose a purity seriously as we walk through this life. Now, God spoke through Moses, and he told his people this. You're familiar with these verses. The Lord said this, For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy. Why? Because he said, I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11. So if you think that this command was only uh, for the Jews, and it, it would be easy for us if it was just for the Jews and the time that they were living following the Lord, well, then that would be wrong thinking, just to think it was for one specific group, because God spoke through the apostle Peter as well. God spoke through the writers of the Old Testament. God spoke through the writers of the New Testament as well. And so Peter is picking up that Old Testament command of God, that call of God, to live pure, holy lives, and he repeats it to believers today. Peter wrote this, Like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because as it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, behavior means our manner of life, our conduct of life, how we live our life. So what is Peter really saying to his readers there as he uh, um, uh, captures once again this command of God from the Old Testament? Well, he's saying this, listen, Christians, the God who saved you, the God who has forgiven your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, the God who sent his son to die in your place so that you might know the hope of eternity, the God who bought you with the price of his own son, the God who is now your heavenly father, the God that you look to, worship, praise. Well, he is holy. He is righteous. He is perfect. And because your heavenly father is perfect, you as his blood-bought child 
are called to reflect Him, to reflect His glory in and through our lives. It means that you are to be holy as well. You are already sanctified, set apart by God, but there's a pursuit in our own life as we seek the righteousness, the holiness of the Lord God. So let's think about some areas in which we can sink our teeth into when it comes to uh, this pursuit of the holiness of the Lord. First is this, we're, we're to be holy in all of our conduct. Now, let me say as, as the caveat, I realize that we are flesh and blood. We are tempted. We get selfish. We uh, don't respond rightly all the time. But so, so that is the caveat. And I understand that just as well as you understand that. But this is the pursuit of our life. We are to be holy in all of our conduct, every aspect of our life is to be conducted in a way that brings glory to the Father. Now, holy, holiness is not something we carp, uh, compartmentalize then. We don't get to be religious and righteous at certain times of, of the week or the day, and the other times we get to relax and just be, just be human. Holiness is a pursuer of the Lord Jesus. Holiness is, well, that's, that's a way of life. It's what we're pursuing in all of our life, in all of our relationships, because it affects everything that we do. It affects the way we approach every single moment of every single day. Holiness this then becomes a lifestyle we are pursuing for the glory of Jesus Christ, rather than a mere conformity to a set of rules. We are seeking the glory of God in all that we do, and that, that directs and impacts our own conduct. We are to be holy by not conforming to our former way of life. Now, I know some of you were children when you came to faith in Christ, and that's great, and that's fantastic. And so you may not have much of a former way of life to look back on, but many people come to faith as adults or as teenagers, and there's a former way of life in which they uh, can look back on, and sometimes we tend to, to glamorize that life or want that life once again. Listen, we need to remember this. Because you are sanctified in Christ, that signifies and reflects that your life has been changed. There's been a change that has taken place in you. You are dead in your sin and trespass. Now you are alive in the Lord Jesus Christ, who you were before salvation is no longer who you are now. We forget that sometimes. You were saved for the purpose of reflecting the glory of God. And if you are not reflecting a holy God, then, then it's time for us to examine our lives. And thankfully, the Spirit of God does that every day, continually, every day, as we seek to be selfish, as we seek to step out of uh, the, uh, God's will for us, the Spirit of God convicts us, drawing us back to the Father. It is easy for us to let that former way of life creep back in, but that's not who we are anymore because we have been raised in Christ. And He no longer, I no longer live, Paul said, but He now lives in me. The third thing is this, we are to be holy by imitating God, by imitating God. We're to be holy because God is holy. This means first, uh, we come to know God, we seek relationship with the Father, and then by His grace, well, we seek to conduct our lives in a manner that imitates Him. Now, obviously, we are not God. That is a very wrong theology, or that we are little gods. That is a heretical theology. But we have the Spirit of God living within us. And because we are now the children of God, we have the ability to love what He loves. As He shows us in His Word what He loves, we have the ability to love what He loves. We have the ability to hate what He hates. We have the ability to seek what brings glory to Him. We have the ability to be merciful because He is a gracious and merciful God. We have the ability to make right choices because He gives us His, own, His very own mind uh, to, to know what is of Him or what is not of Him. We become holy as we are conformed to the image of the Father. This is so important to that process 
of sanctification in our lives. We grow up in our relationship with him, knowing the Father, therefore being able to respond and live rightly in such a way that reflects his glory in and through our lives. And this is exactly what Paul is requesting, what he's exhorting of the Thessalonians that they do. He freely admits that that they are believers who are pleasing to God with their life. And we see that in the early part of this book. And friend, you may be pleasing to God, and I hope that you are pleasing to the Father. But that never means that we are satisfied in our walk. It never means that we grow so comfortable that we stop pursuing the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, because God has given us this wonderful ability to reflect His glory through our lives because we have been made alive in Christ. Notice what Paul says to people who are pleasing to the Lord. He said, we ask and encourage that you do this even more. What is that? That is an urging to continue. Do this even more. That word excel, I like that out of the New American Standard. It's the word excel even more. I like that word because it means to overflow. It means to exist to full quantity. Exist to full quantity. Get out everything that life uh, is possible uh, through the Lord. Exist in that way. To go above or beyond. This inter- the interesting thing about this word is the tense of this word. It's a present tense subjective uh, verb. Now, what does that mean? Those are big words. Present active means that it means it, this should be an ongoing activity in your life. This should just be something that you do on a continual basis. The subjunctive part of that, though, means this. It means it is possible for you to grow in holiness. And so, listen, friend, it, it is God's will for your life that you grow in maturity, that you grow in holiness. It is God's will for your life that he be seen in and through living through your life. God has called you to purity. He's called you to holiness and not just average purity, not just average holiness, but overflowing purity, overflowing holiness. And here is the good news. It's possible because he's placed his spirit within us. He's given us his word. And so we don't just flounder around thinking, well, I can never change these habits. I I can never uh, get out of this cycle of sin. That's not true. Because it is possible. Because God's made it possible for us to grow up in holiness and purity. Now listen, you, you might be satisfied with a little bit of Christianity. A lot of people are, but God is calling you to excel still more, to go far above and beyond what you believe you could. Uh, Preacher, I I don't know that I could change, someone might ask. Well, I I encourage you, ask the Lord to show you how to change. And He will show you. Preacher, I, I I don't have the strength to change. I agree with you. I don't either. But the Lord's given us His Holy Spirit who can give us the strength, the motivation, the will, the desire to seek purity in our lives and to grow up in sanctification that the Lord is able to give to us. Well, preacher, I don't guess I have any excuses anymore, do I? No, you don't have any excuses anymore. Neither do I. God has saved you. God has called you to be holy. Will you commit to pursue holiness in your life this very moment? Commit to the pursuit of holiness. Now, there's a general section there that the Lord has said, I want everyone to be uh, 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 sanctified and pure and pursuing holiness in their life. But Paul goes on to write uh, another section here uh, dealing with this aspect of sexual immorality. It It might seem odd that For one moment, Paul would speak about the general will of God, then he would dive into something very, very specific in uh, this instance. Well, uh, in the context of the Thessalonians, this makes sense in our own context, in our culture. It should make sense to us 
uh, as well. Thessalonica was a Greek city. Uh, they were ruled by the Roman Empire by Jewish standards. It was a city that was filled with unbelieving Gentiles. Uh, they weren't even worthy of being in their own presence. With Paul's evangelism, though, many, many Thessalonians did what? Well, they came to faith in Christ. The Spirit of God moved, drawing them to Himself. And those individuals called on the name of the Lord Jesus for the salvation of their soul. But those believers still lived where? Well, they still lived in that city. They still lived in that culture that they knew, grew up in, and more importantly, that they once participated in. Remember those old, that old way of life that I discussed earlier? So what was the culture like that they were surrounded by? Well, the Thessalonians believers had come out of a culture of gross idolatry, which had little or no restraint, specifically in the area of one's moral character, and, and specifically in this matter of sex. Because they worshipped a, a pantheon of gods, there were uh, 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 temple prostitutes and prostitution going on. It was just a part of their life. They thought nothing of it. It was embedded in who they were. And so that moral climate uh, there in Thessalonica, even though being a Greek city, was still ruled by the Roman Empire. And it was just very, it was morally decadent with no uh, a sense or uh, uh, about uh, uh, being pure and, and holy whatsoever. One Historian wrote this, Immorality was a way of life. Thanks to slavery, people had leisure time. We deal with this in our own culture, uh, our leisure time. Because of leisure time, they could indulge in the latest pleasures. So the Christian message here of living a holy life, pursuing Christ, pursuing a Holy God, well, that was something very new to their culture, something that they had never heard before. It was not easy for these young believers to fight this temptation. And so Paul is addressing this as a part of their conduct, as a part of their seeking the holiness of God. So you can see why he might have wanted to return, as he wrote earlier, why he wanted to return so strongly back to them to help grow them up, to help uh, finish what was lacking in their faith. And so you and I must live with that same determination. We must live with the same determination to live a holy life in the midst of our own culture, our runaway culture. The reality is this. I recall our culture reflects very strongly of the first century culture when it comes to sexual immorality, when it comes to the pursuit of what satisfies the flesh. So sexual perversity, promiscuity, uh, and promotion, are, those are very normal things for us. We see them in so many aspects of our culture, and, and most likely it's going to increase. And so the question then becomes, how do I as a Christian respond? Well, we respond the way the, God, the Word of God tells us to respond. What does God's Word say? Well, God's Word says that I abstain that I pursue the holiness of God. And so the reality of sanctification is this. Number one, it comes from God. That sanctifying spirit comes from God. The pursuit of that holiness driven by the Spirit of God comes from the Lord. But there's a part of you, there's a part of this grace gift that the Lord has given to us that we play in this growing in holiness and purity. In this instance, growing in holiness requires you to abstain from sexual immorality. So the word abstain means complete abstinence. So in this case, it means staying completely away from any thought or behavior that violates the principles, violates the word of God. Now, why does Paul call the Thessalonians to abstain from sexual immorality? Well, he understands from a cultural perspective how destructive this sin is. He wrote to the, to the Corinthians, flee sexual immorality, run from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits outside of the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. And so God's word is saying to us, 
that this sin destroys lives. This sin destroys families. This sin destroys nations. And so there is no sin so pleasurable so as to mute that pain of destruction. So in verse 4, we are instructed in God's Word. I have to respond, number one, by controlling my body. Have you ever lost control of your body? Have you ever just lost control, not able to control your body? It's, it's a bit of a scary thing if you've ever experienced uh, that. A number of years ago, uh, my appendix decided it wanted to come out of my come out of my body, and so I went to the emergency room, and they gave me a medication in that emergency room, supposed to heal the nausea, you know, that I was feeling, and supposed to uh, put down, uh, quell some of the pain that I was feeling. But before I knew it, before I knew it, my arms were were going up and down. My legs were going up and down. My hands were going up and down. Uh, I, I looked. I looked like a politician at a parade, man. I just could not control uh, my arms or my legs. And so, followers of Jesus are not supposed to live out of control. Followers of Christ are not supposed to live out of control. Why? Because followers of Jesus are controlled by the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit of God to control us. We have the Spirit of God to direct us. Scripture says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> this is verse 19 of chapter 6, 1 Corinthians. Verse 18 I just read. This is verse 19. Don't you know that your body is the temple, a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you whom you have from God? And so God, if God is able to, is going to use us for His glory, then I need to possess my own body, which means that I master my own body and not allow my body, my flesh, to master me. Now, Paul uses an interesting description in verse 5 there that uh, gives great clarity to what he is communicating to us. He uses the word lustful passion, lustful passions. This phrase is, best described as being completely out of control. Think about that. Completely out of control. We're called to control our bodies. But he says we're not supposed to be this way, completely out of control of our bodies. We are not saved to live out of control. We are saved to live under the control of the Spirit of God. And when we live out of control, we allow our flesh to have control. Those desires, those impulses, those urgings, those things are directing us and not our heart and our mind following after Christ. And in doing so, we reject the Lord God as we allow our flesh to control us. It's a bit of a stinging indictment here that uh, he gives to us uh, at the, um, uh, at, at, in verse 8, consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God. That is a stinging indictment. I think to myself, I would never willingly reject God. Would you willingly reject the Lord God? But when I live out of control and lustful passion, Scripture is saying to us, we're not rejecting man, we're rejecting God. Friend, that's not God's will for your life, to live out of control. He's given us His Spirit so that we can live under control, under His control. Will you let Jesus have control of your life? Remember the chauffeur who parked three feet away from the wall? He had no desire to risk damaging that vehicle. You know your life is so much more valuable to God, so much more valuable to, to God. Your holiness and purity are too valuable to risk by not excelling still more in Christ and fulfilling, uh, and instead of flirting with that destruction of sexual immorality. So I want to encourage you with this. Will, will you commit to purity today? Will you commit to pursuing the holiness of God in your life. It's possible. Will you commit to do it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these, were, these words and 
the truth that you've given to us. Father, may we heed these words like someone who builds his house on a foundation uh, of rock rather than sand. Lord, may we heed these words for your glory alone. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brad. If you have any questions about today's message, about the church, about Jesus, there is somebody on staff right now that would love to visit with you. Just call the number below. Again, Awana starts September 9th. Visit the church's website for all the details, and we will see you again next week.